after hearing a lot of conversations today, which have been about the nitty gritty of tools, that my talk is a little bit different. I think I want to talk today about community. I almost want to laugh at saying that, but um, <laughs> but but I do want to talk about community. Um, and I want to specifically begin by asking you about some of the communities that you have lived in. And specifically, I'm not trying to like make a weird thing here, but how many of you have lived in a conservative community? And I'm not talking like you once knew somebody who voted for Bush, but like <laughs> lived in a community that had really strong, very conservative values. Okay, a lot of people. Good. I was really worried that like you were all from New York or something and that, <laughs> and that this was just going to be kind of a dead exercise. Okay, so for those of you who have lived in what you feel to be really conservative communities, for how many of you that religion is really a factor in the conservative community in which you've lived? Okay, so a fair few of you. And that really describes the community that I live in, teach in. I teach in St. George, Utah, and Utah is that very Mormon state. And the community that I live in is very heavily Mormon. I think it's 60 to 70% Mormon. And that's very much reflected in my students. And just to be clear, I, I am also Mormon, but, but of a much more liberal and progressive and feminist kind. <laughs> and so I engaged in a project um, last spring and I, and I just want to tell you a little bit about it. And I was asked to speak specifically about student responses to my particular project. And I'm going to get there. So I was at that camp last year, and I had a, this really great experience. And I did a couple of things that really stood out to me. One was Paul Jaskett's talk, which has been mentioned earlier today, about visualizing data from the Holocaust, specifically in which the way in which they visualize data about the building campaigns at Auschwitz. I had never really considered art history as data. Even though I used tables and spreadsheets as a grad student, I just never had heard somebody use that word data in relation to art history. My husband is a computer scientist, and I'm pretty sure that that's what he did, but I was pretty sure that it wasn't what I did. And so that was really new. And, then, and at that same time, I'd never properly been to New York. And so as an art historian, I went to MoMA. And it was this fabulous experience. And the thing that I've been most looking forward to seeing was the early modern art. I'm a medievalist, but I was really looking forward to seeing the early modern art. And there was this exhibit on at the time called Inventing Abstraction. And some of you, no doubt, have seen this. And on the wall going into this exhibit was this, was this data visualization visualizing the social, ne the social networks of artists from the early modern period. And I thought, wow, that's, that's kind of awesome. And I took this back, and we were, I was doing an upper division class in modern art at the time. And so I very appropriately you know, kind of showed my students this visual visualization. And if you go to the um, Inventing Abstraction website, it's super interactive. And if you click on a particular artist, so here we see a lot of artists, and it looks kind of messy. But if you click on a particular artist, you can see their individual social network and the other connections, social connections within that network. And I thought that was an interesting thing. At the time, I was teaching this 20th century class. And as a feminist who was kind of fed up with the traditional way of doing things, I decided that we were only going to study female artists um, in this particular class, um, and that we were going to do things a little bit differently. And I showed this to my students, and they observed that there were maybe eight or nine women that were represented here, and they felt that that was really underrepresenting women, which is one of our classic problems in art history. We decided as a class that we were going to engage in a project um, where we were going to represent, learn about, and represent the social networks of female artists in the 20th century. And we expanded our search from about 1910 to maybe 1970, 1960, 1970. Um, so I had my students investigate the social networks of, of female artists. And then I did something I've never really done before, which is I attempted to visualize art history in some way. And this was tricky. So the first step was to collect information on particular fem uh, female artists, which we did in a Google Docs spreadsheet. And that allowed us to work collaboratively and allowed a lot of stu the students to kind of all input their artists. They each selected a particular uh, female artist those individuals are detailed in the first column. And then we tried to detail all of their social connections, which they found out through secondary research and primary research and that kind of thing. 
We also tried to understand the sexual orientation of these various artists and the people that they were communicating and that they were socializing with as that was a particular interest of the class, both gender and sexuality. And so we tried to kind of create this chart, or uh, this table, which detailed a primary individual and then all of the people that they knew socially. And so my students, as they engaged in their secondary reading, added to this chart. A student from another class who was working in visual technologies helped us kind of turn our chart into a very messy looking data visualization. <laughs> and, and, and it's okay, I can say that it's messy and I can say that there are problems with it, it's an undergraduate project, and, but this, this, was, this was pretty good. I'd, I'd never done anything like this before. He downloaded our, our chart and then was able to kind of connect that into this particular visualization. But like the earlier visualization, if you, if you clicked on a particular individual, you were able to see all of that individual's social connections. Now, there were definitely, this is not you know, the perfect undergraduate project, and my students who are not especially familiar with French names often mistook male individuals for female individuals, <laughs> which kind of messes up some of, uh, sorry? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and, so, and so, yeah, and so, and so, you know, but that's, but if you've never left Southern Utah, you don't really know about French names, and that's and, that, and that's okay. That is a limitation um, of my students and their experience, and that's you know something to be recognized and corrected. But it is what it is. The individuals who are in gray are our primary individuals, and so we could kind of try and connect. And what we were trying to do was trying to understand if female artists worked and socialized in the same way that male artists did. Because you know we know that early modern artists, that their social networks are really important for their spreading of ideas. And we wanted to try and understand how female artists did that, if they had their own social networks, or if they just kind of latched onto male social networks, and how, and how that whole social networking thing worked for women artists of the early 20th century. Because of the messiness of the visualization, although I can't really blame just the messiness of the visualization. I also want to blame the the biases of, of the secondary sources that my students looked at, which really favored mentioning male artists, more famous male artists, over their less female, less famous female social connections. You know, ultimately I feel that, that the visualization is, is kind of biased towards what the scholarship is biased towards, and I don't fault my, my students for that, but it was quite an exercise it was a really important exercise. Going back to this idea of community, I don't know if this is this true of you and the art history classes that you teach, but in the art history classes that I teach, I see some fairly traditional students. You know, they're 18. They you know they started college when they were 18 or 19, and they moved along a fairly traditional path. They leave fairly ordinary Southern Utah lives. I also attract a lot of students who are a little bit different in our community. Um, or my classes attract a lot of students who are different in our community. I see a lot of gay students. I see a lot of gay former Mormon students. I see a lot of students who want to discuss issues of gender or sexuality, but that's not really appropriate in our community, and that is a difficult thing. In my teaching, I am often trying to look, in, trying to look for ways to explore these issues which are very taboo to talk about, and to try to use art history as a vehicle for discussing these things that are too difficult to talk about otherwise. And I knew as we were going through that my students were becoming more sensitized to issues of gender and sexuality. Um, at the beginning of the class, I asked my students if they ever felt like they experienced gender grief, you know, any, any kind of pushback for the, the way that they wanted to live out their gender as opposed to the way in which other people expected them to live out their gender. And s most of the class said yes, but there were a number of individuals who said no, you know, that they were just fine and their parents were fine with whatever their life choices were with regard to gender and gender roles. And by the end of the class, having chosen a particular artist, so many of my students reported that where they thought they had not experienced gender grief before, they were surprised to suddenly find that it cropped up in their lives. So, you know, I ruined their lives because before, <laughs> before they were just fine with the sexism they experienced, and now they weren't. <laughs> and that was fine, but I had, I had several, several gay students who were really struggling with their identity in, in our community. You know, one who was 
trying to be actively mormon and accept his homosexuality at the same time, and another woman who had a female partner and they have children and struggled to be accepted within their community. other individuals who felt like maybe they were half male and half female but didn't really want to come down firm on one side or the other and what we experienced in this project ultimately was a very affirming thing i interviewed some of these students last week i, I would play the videos for you but they're a little bit undergrads trying to trying to use kind of slightly garbled intellectual speech as i was video interviewing them so it didn't maybe come out in the, quite the way i'd hoped but what they expressed was that they had never realized that art history or scholarship generally could be a vehicle through which they might explore issues that were directly relevant to their lives and had meaning for them and ultimately had meaning for them personally as they tried to work through particular issues in their lives and they'd never seen that feminism was something that you could do actively with regard to scholarship one of my students said you know she didn't really understand that artists could also be gay and that she no longer, as a result of the project, she no longer assumed that all artists were straight and that as a gay female artist in St. George, that it was really helpful for her to study a gay female artist and that that was a really affirming experience as she tried to find a particular artistic identity as a gay woman. I never tried to do that quite with art history to kind of tackle issues in quite that way. And I can't say that I had a particular agenda other than to make my class a safe space for us to explore these particular issues. But what happened was ultimately, ultimately a really affirming experience, both for those who needed to feel affirmed and also for those who maybe needed to think a little more open-mindedly about their communities and to acknowledge that artists could be different and that people could be different. And so as a result, I wrote this paper for the Journal of Interactive Technology and Pedagogy discussing this idea of transformative learning, the idea that there are certain kinds of learning that change us, you know, not just in terms of what we know, but really change us. And I think m the majority of my students reported having changed. And, and we talked about this, you know, they didn't see particular kinds of problems at the beginning of the semester and they saw them at the end of the semester or they never really noticed or cared about like LGTB issues at the beginning of the semester. They didn't think they were really relevant in our community, but they could see that they affected art history and they could begin to see that those issues affected students in our class. And so there was a greater, I think, process of becoming more sensitive to these issues and becoming more aware of these issues. And also what I saw was great critical thinking as my students began to question the biases of their various sources. And, and more of that is, is detailed in the paper. And so I guess my, this talk is not really about the nitty gritty of digital tools, which is I think a lot of what we've been hearing today, but digital tools aren't really an end result. This project that I conducted in my class was really about building a sense of community in their classroom and affirming individuals and allowing them a kind of space to kind of discuss sensitive issues. And, and, the, and the digital tools were the vehicle for doing that. And so I just want you in your teaching, in whatever kind of community that you live in, to maybe think about how art history can be a vehicle for discussing sensitive issues, because in all of our communities, those issues are gonna be different. For discussing sensitive issues, and for moving towards a kind of transformative learning process where, our, where we are somehow changed by the things we learn, not changed in a particular direction that we can always see from the beginning, but changed in a fairly organic way. I just want to leave some of those ideas with you and, you know, maybe think about that. Okay, thank you.